All right, good evening. I'd like to call this Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, School Committee Business Meeting to order, please. Mrs. Yell, can you take the roll, please? Here. Sarah Hall? Here. 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 Present. Here. All right, can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, I just wanted to take a, take a quick minute before we start tonight uh, to talk about two, two new reporters um, that passed away recently who had a tremendous impact on the Newport Public Schools. Uh, the first is uh, Coach James T. Stalen, Jim Stalen, whose name bears, uh, will live on forever out in the field, out in the state, uh, World War I stadium. Uh, Coach Stalen came here in 1964, um, and it, it was interesting, you know, he, he turned 90 last year, and, and, and again, went into the hospital a few months ago and, and, and kind of passed away quickly. Um, but it was, it was funny that this happened around the same time as, as former Mayor Byron Matthews also passing away uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, two really giants, particularly uh, in the mid-60s on. Um, when Jim Stalen got here in 1964, he really made New Report athletics, you know, uh, appointment viewing. I think, Steve, you know, Steve growing up here can certainly probably attest to that. Uh, you know, his teams played with class. Uh, they played for him. Uh, he was just uh, an incredible influence, I want to say, on generations of new reporters. Uh, I got to know him. Uh, he transferred over into the, uh, when he got into the 80s, uh, he transferred over to be a, the athletic director and was there up until 1993, which was my senior year. Uh, but just a tremendous uh, influence that a lot of people uh, really helped new report through. You know, this was before, and I mentioned Byron Matthews just because you know, he became mayor in 1968 and kind of shepherded us through this you know, urban renewal and the transformation of our downtown uh, into what we, we all love about New Report today, I think, one of many things we love about New Report. And I think, you know, Jim Stalin coming around at that time really made uh, New Report, you know, brought that pride back to New Report. I think people really cared a lot about their school, a lot about their community, and he kind of rallied uh, those people together starting in 1964 all the way through uh, his tenure at NHS. Uh, and the other person I wanted to mention tonight was Jean Foley Doyle, uh, whose funeral was this past Saturday. Uh, I didn't have her for a teacher. She was my homeroom teacher when I was a freshman, but I know my parents both had her in school, a wonderful history teacher who uh, just brought a lot of energy and life into the classroom. Uh, and then at her days outside the classroom, uh, she was just as energetic and, and put all that love of history into uh, publishing books on the history of New Report, which is pretty incredible too. So she also has a, a long lasting uh, legacy. And again, I was a history major at Ohio State, uh, but I know she really fostered that love of history with a lot of kids that came through New Report. Um, so again, I just wanted to mention them both tonight and I hope you all will join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Vice Chair Hall. Um, did any other members want to comment? Um, I know, Mr. Cole, sometimes you like to say a few words well, of just, remembrance. Just with respect to Mr. Stalen, he, he shaped a lot of young men in this city, and, you know, f for the better, and he was a very caring and dedicated uh, coach, as well as uh, someone who really paid attention to what was done, you know, in the classroom and away from the classroom. And I did have uh, Miss, Mrs. Foley for a history teacher, and basically, you know, it, she was everything you described, Mayor Ridden, and, and, and then some. And, uh, and, you know, Byron was, you know, Byron was a great, great leader, and as you mentioned, helped bring the city through urban renewal and helped us make some really good choices that have you know, pay the dividend that we all appreciate today. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Anyone else? Do we have anyone present for our public comment this evening? Okay, so moving on <coughs> to staff recognitions. All right. I got my extension cord. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, this is, as we say, this is kind of 
an honor to be up here as superintendent, get to recognize some wonderful people within our school community. And tonight's no different. Um, tonight we're going to be recognizing five crossing guards for their hard work, dedication, commitment to the safety of the Newburyport children and families as they travel to and from school each day. As we know, regardless of the weather, our crossing guards assist our children cross busy streets and intersections as they arrive and depart school, and at times, believe it or not, deal with dangerous, even hostile situations. Not in Massachusetts. Massachusetts drivers never get angry at people, so um, no. Um, so always put the student first and uh, making sure the streets are safe to cross for, for everybody. They're, to me, the true unsung heroes of the district. Um, in all great organizations, um, everyone has a, a vital, important role, and our crossing guards um, are there for us each and every day. And as superintendent, on behalf of the public schools, I want to thank them for their dedication and hard work. We truly appreciate uh, your efforts. So at this time, I'm going to call, um, I'd like to call you up, and we can... Uh, stand over there and we'll take some photos afterwards. Um, Joanne Yell did an amazing job. I want to give her credit. I love the little stop signs on the bags. Uh, stop to be recognized. So um, I don't want to take credit for that, Joanne. Thanks. Um, so we have Janet and Frank Crump. Come on up and we'll stand over there. Uh, six and a half years, and they crossed the Bresnahan School. And I don't. I think Frank's uh, doing the laundry right now. No, he has a seven o'clock online class. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'd like to also call up Jude Nelson. Uh, she's been here for one year and helps cross the Knock and the Mullen School students. Come on up. And then we have Diane Learned, six years at the Knock Mullen Crossing. Thank you very much. And we'll have them stand over there, Mia. We'll take a team photo after. Um, and then also Robin Turner, 21 years. Um, she's currently crossing at the high school. And she's also, uh, Robin's also a lunch monitor at the Bresnahan. And believe it or not, uh, her 21 years of dedication has worn many hats to the Newburyport Public Schools. She worked as a sub, lunch monitor, crossing guard at all our schools. And we can always count on her uh, to step up when we need her, always willing to help out. So uh, Robin Turner, too. All right, round of applause for our <laughs> crossing guard. a photo off. Let me get on the end here. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, it's recognition. Okay, say stop. 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 <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You Thank you. Sign in. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> Thank you. I might need that during the budget presentation for questions. Stop sign. <laughs> I don't know if you want to take a quick recess, or are we good? Uh, it's up to you. I think we're good. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Just like your mother and father together. So we can just, everyone's taking a quick moment. Yeah, and then we'll just, we can jump right back in. So. So up next, um, we have the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Callahan, do we have warrants this evening? Uh, yes, we do. <clears throat> I move that the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in an aggregate $636,897.15 be approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There are no conflicts. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
All right, we have two sets of minutes to approve this evening. Um, the first one is a business meeting from April 3rd. Uh, are there any corrections to those minutes? Move we adopt the minutes of April 3rd. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, then the second set of minutes was this special meeting from um, April 11th. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Walker, Ms. Higgins were not in attendance at that meeting. Uh, any, any corrections? Okay, we can get a motion. So moved, so moved. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Uh, I don't need to, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Can you approve minutes real quick? Yes. Right. So um, we're all set with consent agenda. We're ready for the student representative report. Okay. Um, starting with college and career center news, the high school will have a session on dual enrollment on Thursday, April 27th at 8:15 with our partners from Northern Essex Community College discussing how and when to get started with dual enrollment classes and the value of why. And staff from College Aid Pro on Thursday, May 4th at 8 a.m. will be speaking about the financial aid process and all that goes into dealing with the FAFSA, CSS profile, scholarships, and even how to appeal an award. In the next two weeks, our students will be completing their dual enrollment forensic science course through Endicott College. The professor of this course is also a sergeant for the crime scene department of the Massachusetts State Police. He has been working, he has been wonderful and our students have really enjoyed his perspective and experience working on extreme cases. 27 students had the opportunity to take the class. Last night, all students individually presented a forensic science case they had the most interest in. We have received wonderful feedback from the students. The next Endicott course will be offered to students through May and July, and it is about the, it is an introduction to information and computer technology class. We greatly appreciate that the NEF has continued to fund the dual enrollment opportunity with Endicott College. And for student recognitions, the Climate Cafe recently, Sophia Franco was one of several students from the North Shore who facilitated a Climate Cafe. Through this, she led dialogue with residents from the North Shore regarding ways to support our environment. Um, and the National Historic Sites Cleanup. On May 6th, Senior Sophia Hartford is the coordinator for the series of service opportunities. Plum Island Beach Cleanup. Last week, over 70 students participated in the beach cleanup at Plum Island organized by Nolan Smith and ACES. It is very exciting to have so many students spending time to support our community. Okay, and now for the Rotary Fashion Show and the Interact Club. Um, so last week, students Abriana Cronstrom, Alex Sullivan, Ava Moran, Claudia Cummings, and Emily Kate Slocum supported the Newburyport Rotary, Rotary Club at their annual fashion show. These students are a part of the Interact Club, which is our largest student organization. It consists of over 150 students who participate in a variety of service events across the school year. This is a great club for students to become a part of and make new friends. Um, for the Belize trip, 37 NHS students and six staff chaperones successfully completed an eight-day learning trip to Belize over April vacation. Students visited two Mayan archaeological sites, learning about who the Mayans were and are today, took a jungle survival course, and learned how to make snares, hammocks out of sticks, leaves, and vines, build a fire, collect water, and they ate termites, which are high in protein and taste minty. <laughs> Um, students also visited a primary <laughs> school and learned about the education. Minty to me. But. <laughs> um, and learned about the education system in Belize. And finally, they studied the ecosystem by visiting a butterfly nature preserve, the Belize Zoo, and snorkeled along the largest living barrier reef in the world. And what can be done to preserve and restore these habitats. And then for congratulations, congratulations to Ava Maglio, who's the recipient of the Mass Art and National Art Association Scholarship Award, which gains her participation in the summer studios sponsored by the Hemphill Family Foundation and Massachusetts College Art and Design, um, College of Art and Design. And congratulations to all the students who are inducted into the National Art Honor Society on April 4th, and also the students who are inducted into the National Honor Society on April 13th. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, on to the budget. All right. <clears throat> Do you want to call up 
Mr. Little Hill now? Or? Sure. <laughs> Mr. Little Hill, you want to? Um, yeah, you can sit there. <clears throat> you do have a little nameplate that says your name, or you can stick with student representative if you want. <laughs> can I sit there? Then? <laughs> Okay, um, so we have our uh, final budget presentation. I have some uh, slides in the beginning, and then uh, afterwards, you know, we'll sit down and go through the budget book if there's any further questions. I did receive some great questions from school committee, uh, and part of the information that you have in front of you is very detailed answers to a lot of those specific questions. Um, and you know, so we can follow up, I think, after uh, with that, or if there's any more follow-up questions uh, on some of those. So um, as we move <coughs> forward for our FY24 budget proposal and final, hopefully, budget proposal, as we recall, um, this is our budget summary. Um, and we've down to a 4.5 um, city allocation. And as you can see, we shifted some of those funds over uh, for the overall budget of 6.6 uh, .6, um, overall total. And as you see, you know, I won't go through all of those line items. We've talked about these multiple times, but really our state circuit breaker uh, funding, our ESSER 3 grant, um, and some of these other projects, school choice, uh, also assisting with a lot of our funding uh, for this fiscal year. Oop, so there's our 4.5, and then on the bottom, the 6.6. .6. So I think on April 3rd, we were at a 5.3 city allocation, uh, and we reduced that uh, to the 4.5. So as we've, you've all have seen this um, before, so all in the blue, if you look down on the bottom, that's funding through savings, grants, and other funds. Um, and then what we've done as we've gone back uh, to do revisions, the special education, uh, the BCBA increase, the language-based teacher and special education teacher, we're shifting those funds to uh, circuit breaker reimbursement um, because we did get a, a bump in that and we feel very comfortable that we can cover those costs um, on the circuit breaker. So what remains um, right now are the assistant uh, groundskeeper, the tech integrator, the little bump of the point two math teacher, um, and the ask in the music. What did I say? Math. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Music. Thank you. Point two music teacher, um, and then the ask in the global citizenship piece. So throughout our process, I think the several presentations um, and also the uh, Superintendent Advisory Committee, we did our April 3rd budget presentation. So we felt kind of condensing a lot of the most frequently asked questions uh, <coughs> that we received by the community um, and other city officials. So we try to put together um, how the budget gets developed from a lot of the most asked questions on the school side. So as we all know, how are the schools funded? Uh, the first piece is Newberry Port allocation. 85% of our budget is the city allocation, which uh, covers the salaries, the steps, columns, and a lot of the personnel. Also the Chapter 70 funds, and then other uh, state aid that the city of Newberry Port gets, and then there's other city revenues uh, that come into the city of Newberry Port. The remainder of the budget is funded by exactly what we said. Um, the reimbursements uh, that we receive from the state and federal programs, Medicaid, special education circuit breaker, school choice funds. And then we have grants, um, both the entitlement and competitive grants, and then the fees that we've been talking about, transportation, athletic, building rentals, and our preschool tuition. Um, and just when we're looking at grants, that money uh, that is one that the entitlement grant is the state and the feds are seeing a need for our students and our population. Uh, and the competitive, competitive grants are also tied to the needs of the schools. So a lot of these grants that we apply for and or the entitlement grants, 
the federal government and the state see the needs of the district. So that's a lot of that grant that we pursue has to tie to the needs of our population. So it's not just free money and they're gonna, state's just gonna go out and say, oh, here's a half a million dollars because you, know, you guys are good people. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So that's why a lot of the uh, shifting ties in to a lot of our initiatives and also the needs of the district. So as we've talked about in previous budgets, what drives the school budget? Um, as we said, the budget drivers each year that are pretty consistent and typical and predictable. Um, the first one is enrollment and population changes. So as we all know, um, one example would be our newcomer families coming into the district the past couple of years. Um, those population changes allow us um, to advocate for more funding. Our enrollment uh, in the special populations also tie in to um, uh, special education, um, students you know, with learning disabilities, and things like that. The second piece is salary increases. We know we can look at going into even next year. Typically what our contract obligations, including steps and lanes and cost of living, is going to be. Um, transportation. Uh, unfortunately, we can predict that, and we already know it's going to go up astronomically. <laughs> unfortunately, it's one of those budget drivers um, for all districts that's very concerning, both general ed and special education costs. Operations and maintenance, you know, the service contracts, building and grounds, maintenance, supply and equipment needs, and utility costs. Uh, we can pretty much estimate and predict that, especially with inflation. We're estimating about a $200,000 increase just in uh, those costs. In special education, especially out of district tuition and transportation, um, we can drive, we can kind of predict of what those costs are going to be. And then fees and grants. So there is fluctuations in outside revenue user fees and competitive entitlement grants. So if we don't hit a demographic for an entitlement grant, we may lose some funding. But typically, it's pretty fairly uh, consistent, and we start to base the budget um, off of those areas. So what's a level service budget? Because we've been talking about this a lot. So level service <coughs> budget um, and what's considered are those budget drivers, salaries, and we'll get to that uh, next slide after this. But as I said, the operational uh, expenses, inflation, impact, energy costs, supplies and materials. Uh, we're obviously seeing a cost increase because of the uh, inflation impact. And then uh, changes in grants and user fees. So what are our budgetary salaries? So as we all know through the multiple budget presentations that we've done, uh, Newburyport has um, union and non-union employees. Um, I think we're approximately 450 uh, employees throughout the district. There are three unions in our district, Teachers Association, ASME, Instructional Assistance. And then we also have salary obligations that include the cost of living. So sometimes on some of our budget presentations, you'll see COLA, and that's what that stands for, the cost of living adjustments. And then all three unions have step and lanes built into their salary schedule uh, according to the contracts. So years of service um, will, could create a step change. Postgraduate credits for our staff that's continuing their education could lead to a lane change. So salary lines also include substitute teachers and non-union employees such as uh, administrators throughout the district. So we've talked about Chapter 70 uh, multiple times, and as we all know, um, <coughs> Chapter 70, some of the key factors are your foundational budget, enrollment, inflation, and the wage adjustment, and then also um, other contribution, property taxes, resident home uh, income, and then some uh, municipal revenue growth factor. So we have this chart, um, Newburyport uh, got a bump in Chapter 78 by almost a million dollars uh, this year. We also want to, um, that was also part of 
the kindergarten um, going full free tuition, we could count those numbers within our student enrollment. So that's a, that's a positive piece in Chapter 70 aid for Newburyport. We haven't seen a jump like that in a lot of years. Um, what is circuit breaker funding? So these, um, in Chapter 70 formula, uh, the way the state does that is still very complex. You have, you know, people could come in and go through that. Chap uh, circuit breaker funding is a little bit easier. Um, so basically, over a threshold um, for circuit breaker, we'll get 75% reimbursement. So typically, the threshold, um, certain threshold is around $47,000. Um, that it would cost to educate uh, a student um, with special needs. And once you go over that $47,000, you will qualify for circuit breaker reimbursement Will is at 75%. One of the things the governor um, has said that she's going to keep that at 75%, that's the state law. Uh, in the past, you really couldn't count on circuit breaker being at 75%. Typically, it would come in around 70 to 72 percent, uh, which also added a lot of stress to districts. <clears throat> and then this is a common question uh, we receive a lot, uh, especially in Newburyport. Our enrollment has stayed pretty much steady within 100 students over the past 10 years and almost even 20 years. So the question that we receive sometimes is, well, why if costs are going up while your enrollment stays re relatively steady. Um, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, the first factor, um, as we look at um, Chapter 766, which was passed for students with disabilities back in the 1970s, it was a great law to bring equality uh, to students with disabilities. Um, for us, it translates to Chapter 71B, um, and then 603 CMR 28. So one of the big pieces from the uh, North Shore superintendents is to really look at this formula because the law hasn't, the, the law is in the books, but the funding hasn't changed. Um, so that was one thing um, that we're working, hopefully, with the governor's office to create a committee statewide to really look at um, supporting the Chapter 76, and these are sometimes of those unfunded mandates. Like we're required um, to obviously educate every student, which is you know, a great thing, but the laws really haven't caught up to the times of, uh, you know, 50 years ago, I think, was when Chapter 766 was passed. So the increase uh, for us is really a special education enrollment, so I'm going to show you a slide right after this one. So increased cost providing special education services. Um, there's higher teacher-student ratios. So when we're talking about special education, there are certain ratios tied to the laws um, for students with special needs. So it could be a one to eight ratio. Um, it could be a one to five ratio, depending on the learning disability, or and sometimes it could be a one to three ratio. So higher teacher ratios to students um, is a big factor. Transportation is also included, free transportation for students with uh, disabilities um, you know, throughout, especially the out-of-district placement. We've talked about these uh, throughout our budget presentations. Special program development, language-based individual development center, post-grad strategies, and therapeutic programs um, to educate all of our students. COVID staff uh, staffing, so you'll see uh, we, we'll talk about this because we do have extra funds supporting learning loss. And remember, those are targeted funds specific at this time. And as we move forward, we may not need those positions um, in the future. And then the other piece here is the increase for social emotional support. So a lot of the funding increases with staffing is geared towards uh, behavioral specialists, um, counselors, adjustment counselors, social workers, specific um, students, teachers with uh, specific uh, certifications 
to address different students within the district with different learning disabilities. And then the last piece is medical needs is also part of those costs. So uh, students that need uh, nursing on site, one-to-one -one nursing, medical um, support is the cost that um, we encumber throughout the operational budget. So the North Shore superintendents have been working together for a long time <coughs> um, because you know, the discussions that we have in Newburyport are going around the North Shore. And this is, I think, a nice illustration from 2007 to 2023. So they took the average of North Shore districts, um, which we have 24 on the North Shore, um, <coughs> and then they highlighted a lot of some of the KPN districts. So when you look at um, this box here in um, 2007 to 23, so general fund of an operational budget has increased by 55.9%, so almost 60% over that time. When you look at special education, out of district budgets has increased within that time period by almost 100%, at 95%. Part of that um, funding is also the transportation for students out of, out of district, and that has increased by 83%. When you look at the total student enrollment on the North Shore, um, within our Newburyport, we've kind of been steady, but some districts have dropped their enrollment overall. But their special education enrollment has increased by 30% over that time. And then the special education district enrollment has increased at that time. So when you're going back to looking at budgets and why they're increasing costs, not only in Newburyport, but throughout all the districts in the Commonwealth, it's because of, um, because of those costs that are not necessarily adding uh, mainstream teachers, it's providing the support for these children that need this support. So by no means are we saying, hey, you know, we love our children, we wanna support them 100%. But if we keep going down this path as a state, um, and this is why the superintendents want to have a, a committee to really look at this. Eventually, transportation and special education costs are going to continue to increase to the point where it's going to be unfundable. Um, so that's why um, our, you know, our district, but along with the North Shore superintendents, are really um, kind of getting the ear of some legislators and uh, state officials. Um, because it's a it's a problem and you can see the cost over that time period so we have the budget book has is there and we'll kind of go through that with mr. little Hale. Um, and then we have a live link um, that people can look at our school committee budget but just to recap again uh, in the budget for the people that are listening when you uh, log on uh, you'll see on the right hand side are our notes um, and as we said before to the school committee, we have a new tech department, so we took a lot of the uh, technology out of the uh, building budgets and moved it over to the tech. Uh, so you'll see that uh, being highlighted. Also, our cost in building maintenance and operations, so throughout our budget, um, when you see those costs, uh, you'll see the increased utility costs. Um, and then some positions that have been reclassified um, which uh, Mr. Little Hale's been doing to really reclassify positions so they fit uh, into our MUNIS uh, descriptions. And then um, the new investments are also noted in the budget book column. And then the budget book reflects all planned expenses for the district funded through a number of sources noted in our budget summary slide, which was that uh, beginning slide. Our grant overview, just once again, that's uh, the entitlement grants versus the competitive grants. Uh, we do have some out there that are still pending that hopefully uh, we'll get some good news in the next couple weeks. Um, and then the last piece is a link to all of the budget presentations uh, here. And I think I wanted to go back just one piece because we have all of the um, descriptions. Let me just, if 
for the um, Oh, I think it's in that. I'm sorry. It's on the. Um, it's in that. I forget which slide it was. Do you remember, Ms. Furlong? What's that? Oh, I see. So it's in the beginning. So the descriptions. All right, I'm sorry. On here, this was an important piece that we wanted to show the link for the people that are watching. So up here on this, this is a live link that's on the website. So see budget center presentations so that people can click on that. And then that brings you to this school committee presentation. So if you wanted to see the, let's say the groundskeeper position, um, it gives you the assistant groundskeeper um, and then gives you the reason why we want to um, add that as part of the budget. So for every new position within this uh, presentation, people can go back and look at the descriptors of um, what the need is and, and the rationale for it. So we felt that that would also be helpful. So we put that on the, the final budget. And I think that's all I have. For at this point, and I'll sit in my seat, and then we can uh, ask more questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you need my mic. Need my mic. All right. Any questions or um, follow up or? I'll go first, I guess. Go ahead. First, I just want to thank Sean and his staff for, uh, you know, working on this budget. You know, we've come down quite a bit from aspirational budget to a few weeks ago to now, um, you know, now your final budget. So I appreciate all the hard work. Uh, I guess my first question is, and I guess this maybe might be for Phil. Um, and so I'll just preface this to like, so I'll be talking a lot tonight from the mayor's perspective and not necessarily the school committee's perspective. Uh, you know, it's funny coming from that chair just a couple of years ago, uh, this year in particular, it's just definitely hit home more about, um, you know, how my role has changed. <laughs> but um, so I guess Phil first, so, I, so the Medicaid piece, we don't include that in the city, um, the city appropriation. Why don't we consider that a part of it? Um, Cause I, you know, I, I guess I would consider that part of it and it's, it's more like 4.6, you know, closer to 4.7 percent. Um, um, historic. Can you hear me with this? Is this close enough? Yeah. I mean, historically, since I've been here, it's always been a separate line in terms of the budget presentation. Okay. Why does it roll in there? I don't know. Yeah. It's just you're right. But you know, we did up the Medicaid portion from 110, which is what it's been for I don't know how many years, up to 200 because last year, in fiscal year 22, it turned out it was either 280 or 335 thousand that we got. And this year we're already at 135,000 with another quarter to go. So in speaking with um, Ethan, he's one who actually suggests we bump it up a sure. little bit. And I went back and said, well, why don't we bump it up a little bit more than that? Yeah. Just so that, you know, try to reflect what's actually coming in. Right. So I just wanted to mention that because that's not included in, in, in what the percentage change is, but that, that, would, that would make it Well, if you, if you split the two out the way, because I'm trying to play math here, mm -hmm. um, what I would call the direct city allocation, which would include the Chapter 70, turns out to be 4.45, and obviously the um, Medicaid goes up by like 90 or 81 percent. Yes, you put the two together combined, it turns out like to be slightly over 4.6 yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, maybe closer to 4.7. Yeah. But from my perspective, in correct me if I'm wrong, I always consider the Medicaid separate from the cities. You know, but if going forward, if we want to roll that back in, so we talk. Well, about I'm the saying same thing. For, for this level, I'm sure I just wanted everyone else to yep. know that 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 that's how I have to think of it because it is it is a higher percentage. Um, okay, so that was my first thing. So thank you for answering that. I guess the other thing I just want to mention. I hope we can have a conversation about it. But is, it looks like there's about eight positions we're trying to add total. Mm -hmm. So just just to tell everyone on the city side, <clears throat> maybe in the last eight years we haven't added eight positions, especially not in one year. But maybe not in eight years total we haven't been able to add eight positions on the city side. And, and I and I know this is different because we're t we're talking with schools and population change. So I guess I'd just like to hear a little bit about. So my my fear is, and maybe Phil, you can answer this too. So we got a bump in the the special education circuit breaker this year, which is great. 
but that could completely be back down next year. And, and it looks like we're trying to fund a number of positions on that. Um, so what happens next year if we don't get the, you know, the bump there, or we don't have the money to, 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 you know, to pay for those I'll positions? I'll talk from the numbers side, and then the superintendent can talk about from okay. the, pro the, prog the program side. Uh, you're right, in terms of ESSER money also disappearing next year, you know, as the superintendent said earlier, you know, ESSER funds have been used for very targeted positions. And one of the things that we have to do in fiscal year 24 is start to review all those positions to see, you know, we're three, four years now into COVID, and I may be overstepping the bounds. We, are they still needed and things like that? And that goes into the program side. Um, so we are aware in terms of what's still being funded from, one, the funds are going to disappear, and then again, in terms of Chapter 70, um, we all know Chapter 70 is sort of like Circuit Breaker. It can be a roller coaster. Um, sometimes it's a really terrifying dive down, and sometimes it's a great ride up. Um, you can't, we don't know what's going to happen next year. We can just go on based on what we've seen in the last couple of years. You know, we've still got a year or two left of SOA to finish getting that implemented, and that's part of the law in terms of impacting Chapter 70. Um, I made my timelines off, and based on some of the comments made by the governor, I think we've got a strong supporter in the state house in terms of education and things like that. So um, I always consider myself a worst case scenario guy. So yes, I'm aware of those things coming down the road. I think we have positioned ourselves pretty well that we can handle um, unexpected things over the next few years. Um, we are fortunate as a district in terms of we have um, very strong interest in other districts and the students here. So we have a good revenue source in terms of uh, school choice. Um, I have to give, uh, where's Andy? Is Andy still here? He's over there. Andy's doing a great job in terms of um, getting uh, foreign students to come over to the high school in terms of um, enrolling for half a year, a year and that. So that's another revenue source um, that we have. We've also been fortunate over the last couple of years in terms of what's been going on with COVID, not expending as much on certain things that we have in the past. So we have been able to build up some, um, I'll call rainy day funds in both transportation and um, school choice, even though we are spending that down. So we are positioned, I think, well for the next couple of years to be able to handle the disappearance of the ESSER funds. And, you know, if we, if we look like a, going, putting my prior career on as a banker, looking at stress tests, you know, I think we can handle for the next couple of years some fairly, fairly, oh God, fairly, um, some fairly decent impacts that may hit us that won't overall necessarily uh, cause us to be in the position where suddenly we got to chop, chop, chop. Mm -hmm. You know, I, again, I'm trying. I don't like making promises that I can't keep. Sure. And so, and again, I think we've positioned ourselves pretty well that we're going to be able to do that. But you know, we always need to be looking at our overall cost structure and what we can do to change it or become more efficient. And so, it's what we do. It's at least what I try to do every day. Yep. So, right. And, and just following up on on that, it's and I think that's one thing that that we've done every year since I've been here is we always look at our programs, reallocate uh, funding within our operational budget to, you know, support staff or offset costs. I think that's really important. When we look at the budget summary, um, that specialized program administrator, um, that's not technically a, a new position. Remember, that was a uh, reallocation of a Bresnahan uh, administrator. And then when we look at the BCBA grade four language-based teacher and special ed teacher at the IDC, that really ties to uh, programming needs uh, for our kids. So that's, that's, uh, that's a necessity uh, in building our special education program. Um, you know, we, without those positions, we're not gonna be able to uh, service as many kids as, as we we plan on and remember part of our goal and strategic plan is to develop in uh, in district programming for our students and families so um, that's why that really ties nicely uh, for circuit breaker because that's really uh, the students that um, we're going to benefit from that um, the other ones um, those are off the table if you recall as i'm looking um, at the scratches um, and then I, as Mr. Little said, ESSER 3 is a specific targeted, a lot of that's those staff are specific targeted staff members to assist with coming out of COVID. So if, if all goes well down, down the road, we may be, you know, reallocating those positions or, or some of those positions may not be needed uh, in the future. So 
um, that's kind of where we're at. And as we went through this budget a few times, we're shifting uh, a lot of the professional development, um, you know, the alternative programs, things like that into ESSER 3, which ties nicely of those of those spending. So we're, we're trying, I, I agree with Mr. Littlehale, and I think we've been very um, calculating over the years to we have a lot of that has been going towards the grants been going towards um, you know technology ventilation but there are some positions that we felt we needed as we came out of COVID um, so we didn't you know add like four English teachers out of SR3 and all of a sudden uh, we're not going <coughs> to teach English so um, that's that's kind of the strategy that we're utilizing uh, these are needed positions that we felt um, we didn't we didn't have to burden the city and the city allocations that we can pick these costs up within our operational budget and or shift some of these over to some of those revenue sources that we have so if i could just add one other thing you go back and look at the demographics of the students with here in newburyport if you go back 20 years and look at what you have now they are very different and again we can go back to our newcomers program you know, you didn't have that five years ago, and we've had to invest quite a bit in terms of resources to be able to put those supports in place to support, put those supports in place to help out those folks who are in the newcomers program. So, you know, things are changing and just trying to adjust what we have to be able to support all of that. Right. I, I, yeah, I have a question. Did you have one? No, go ahead. Um, I'm, I just want to make sure that I understand this because I'm, I'm looking at the, and correct me if I'm wrong, and will probably be correcting me. Um, the FY24 budget, when you actually, when I'm looking at the number of staff that we're adding, at the district level, we're adding one full-time staff. At the high school, we're adding one full-time staff. The uh, BOBAs, BCBAs, yeah. BCBAs is one full-time staff. Yep. Um, the language teacher is an additional full-time staff and the special ed teachers an additional full-time staff but those are actually being taken care of at least for this year and so it's really it's 5.2 really staff it looks like that we're adding just 5.2 staff um, out of asking the city to cover the additional 5.2 staff is that is that my understanding I mean we we figured out how to fund one two three four five six seven eight nine in the in the yellow ones, 10, we shifted 11, over twelve. So we figured out how to s how to serve twelve and uh, positions within the budget as exists. Right, 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 right. right. I think that's right. eight total positions, and many of them are also offset by positions we currently have that we are not carrying forward. Right. right. And I would just remind everyone too, just again, that this is from the city side. This is just accounting for the salaries. So any position we add, all the benefits, that's all falling on the city side too. So it's actually a lot more expensive than actually this looks like. So I think it's over about $330,000 worth of new positions or uh, new positions, but that's just the salaries. All right, just so everyone knows that. Can I just ask um, just a clarifying question here? I, um, so the last time we looked at this, we were at the 5.3% uh, um, increase on the city allocation and now we're at 4.5, which sounds sounds good. Um, did you do that without removing any line items? That's how it looks. I just want to clarify. Yes. You haven't removed anything, any positions, or no. okay. No, so that's all anything. been achieved. That reduction has been achieved by um, shifting shifting the, the funding, funding source. sources. Correct. Okay, but just one, just want to be sure. One of the things that, that. Um, we were able to do. Um, We've had some changes in terms of our out-of-district students for next year, so we were able to back down a little bit of what we thought we were going to be spending and able to use that to then fund those positions using circuit breaker money. And then, so that's what we've been trying to do. My goal, at least my personal goal, was try to come back down as close as we could, looking at other potential funding sources so we didn't have to make any other um, changes in terms of removing anything from the budget from last time. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the positions right now um, is the assistant groundskeeper, the tech integrator, and the point two increase for the music is still on the city allocation side. I have a comment slash question about the, um, the 
on this conversation around positions. So for, for people at home that may not know, a lot of the special students who um, have an IEP and qualify for special education have compensatory services. There are services that, that the school district is required to provide. And so if there are um, you know, a certain number of students, they're going to have to add positions to cover um, those compensatory services, whether they're from positions or from an outside provider. So um, I'm not sure what sort of percentage or number of these positions they might be actually required to fill based on um, students' IEPs. And then um, for those that you might not be required to fill or you, you feel like you need these positions, to have a more robust program, you know, uh, other than the minimum, what are sort of the, you know, general outcomes that you're hoping to see as a result of, of th these positions? Yeah, I think <clears throat> there's a couple of things, and that's a great point, uh, Ms. Higgins, greatly appreciated. So even within our operational budget, oops, I'm sorry, Ms. Yeah, Chair, um, we, we do have, um, we did have some students that we had to provide services and we had to add positions mid-year to cover those uh, mandated costs. Um, so for this piece, uh, some of these positions, one are gonna be assisting those students. Um, so there's program development uh, built into this. So the ultimate goal for this um, is to really, at a younger age and then throughout our um, throughout their processes to keep them in district because if we don't have the staff and the funding to address uh, specific learning disabilities then um, you know that's where we have the out-of-district placement so it's um, the BCBA and these two um, special education uh, teachers are, are in there to assist with some of the learning disabilities that we have mm -hmm. Mr. Callahan. Thanks. Uh, Sean, the, the chance for the special ed, um, what, was the, what was the jump? Like 40, 50 grand? Special, or $500,000 rather? Yes. You were still waiting for information from the state if that was gonna drop mm -hmm. and all. So this budget includes that full number? Correct. So what happens if we pass this and city council passes it and then you find out that the government's gonna change that? What happens to that? extra money that would probably get rolled back into uh, um, circuit breaker, back into circuit breaker. It will go right there we wouldn't have to dig quite so deeply into the circuit breaker okay thanks and that and that's the piece that you know once and this is the um, you know this is I think when we talk about working in the schools like the majority of our efforts are dealing with human beings. So we could set this budget <coughs> as of July 1st, and then there could be needs of students or families that it's gonna change that in the positive or the negative. So right now, as we're looking at out of district placement, we're anticipating that um, maybe one or two of those students may either return back to Newburyport or may be moving out of district. So we're, you know, so that's kind of that, those numbers keep changing um, like throughout the school year. Or we could have a student that is uh, in one of our programs that's not making effective progress that needs to do you know, out of district placement in October. So um, it's not, you, as you're looking at special education costs and circuit breaker and programming, you gotta have that flexibility to, as, you know, to adjust either positive where, you know, where some students are coming back and or uh, a negative impact where you know two or three students need to go out. So that's 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 the challenge of you know working with um, the majority of our work is 100% people. So just one more. So all these presentations you've done and this is hopefully the final one. Would you state that this budget does what's best for all students and? makes the district move forward at the same time? I would. I think a, a lot of this is tied to our strategic plan and the things we want to accomplish. I think, uh, you know, Ms. Walker and, and looking at transportation fees, we've been talking about athletic fees. Uh, we talk about place-based education. So as you see from our conversations, you know, the place-based education is a big piece 
that parents aren't going to have to uh, support. And then the middle school athletics is a big piece that we're taking out of the athletic revolving account. And then we'll have more conversations, I think, down the road looking at, um, you know, the overall athletics and user fees and all of that. But I think for, for us, this, this sets us up in a good position, number one, to continue with the in-district programming and to provide the supports necessary to, for our students and families uh, to keep them in district. Uh, number two, uh, it defrays some of the costs for the parents, right? Um, and number three, you know, when we're looking at the um, advancement of our technology, our one-to-one, -one, that tech integrator position is crucial to shift how we're, you know, fundamentally changing how we're delivering education with the use of technology, not, you know, replacing good teaching. So. Overall, I think we're in a good place um, to move the district forward. Um, <coughs> we're putting all those pieces, I think, in place to, um, you know, to address the needs of all students. So, thank you. Yeah, I was, you kind of answered my question, but I just want to sort of put it out there that um, the interface between the technology integrator and the new one-to-one -one program is like hand in hand. It's Critical. Critical, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Walker. Yeah, and I just want to follow up more on a comment. I mean, I think your presentation related to what the budget drivers are, I think the other budget driver is, you know, we have to be responsive to the needs of our population. And, um, you know, to the mayor's point about adding positions, I don't see this as an apples and apples to what the larger city budget discussion is. I mean, positions are driven by the needs of our students. And if we don't fund those positions, it's not a matter of like, oh, in a few years we can recover that for that student. Nope, two years, three years without that support is a huge gap in that student's um, overall career. And, and to your point also about m moving forward, I mean, we also are responding to a t t continually evolving um, learning environment. You know, um, the responsiveness of our schools during COVID was amazing, but I think we were in a strong place to be able to respond that way, and other districts weren't. And I think we do need to, you know, future-proof ourselves in a lot of ways in, in these budget discussions. We can't be unreasonable and ask the community to fund beyond what is reasonable, but I do think we need to think differently about our schools a little bit than we do maybe other, other city items, in that we really, if we don't fund certain items, it's, it's a big loss for individual students and it's a big loss for families. And I appreciate the priorities um, to not place more burdens on families. Um, we, have, we, we still ask families to pay for athletic fees, we still ask them to pay for transportation costs, but our committee has held firm on not increasing those fees. And I think that's great. I think what you're trying to do is balance not placing burden on families while still being responsive to and continually increasing costs. You know, special education and all the outside other, other needs aside, I think moving forward but also continually being responsive to a changing world is, is really important. And that's just a challenge that schools, you know, I think that puts us in a unique position in terms of the budget that maybe is, is different from the rest of the city. And, you know, obviously we put this in context of the whole city needs, but I think we're in a, it's a slightly different consideration related, specifically related to positions. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments or questions? Yeah, just a, yeah. Just a comment. Um, I, one of the things that I've really grown to appreciate with this district administrative team is that um, <clears throat> they're constantly rethinking, are we, are we getting the bang for the buck? And if we're not, what do we have to do? Um, I, I think that that's really important. I can, I can remember voting on budgets that cut, cut, cut staff. And the rationale was if we, if we just leave a skeleton there, we'll be able to rebuild on it, as in foreign language. And we're still rebuilding on foreign language cuts that we made 14 years ago. Um, we were never able to rebuild. That wasn't a good idea. Um, we did what we had to do at the time, but it was not a good idea. Um, so I'm really glad that we're, you know, we're, we're sort of in a place where the last several years we haven't been talking about cutting, we've been talking about reallocating, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, and when we, um, when we need to add positions, there's a strong rationale for adding those positions in terms of impact uh, on the district and um, 
working with our strategic plan. They're being driven by the strategic plan. So there's a, you know, back in the old days, we used to call that model coherence. You know, we've got the right people doing the right thing at the right cost at the right time with the right students. And that's, that's pretty coherent. And we've been moving in that direction. And I think this budget is another step in that direction. Anyone else? <clears throat> Yeah, Ms. Higgins. Um, I'll just offer a, a comment. I, I really appreciate the, the budget and the transparency that you've shown throughout this process being the first time that I've gone through it. And, um, you know, three of my biggest priorities sitting in this seat um, I see reflected in this budget. And so the first is, you know, addressing those with the greatest needs and our students with disabilities. And we really see that um, coming through in the budget and your um, priorities to increase the types of programming that is um, available for students with disabilities. Um, second is is literacy, and I, I just feel so strongly, particularly with early literacy, but throughout all the early grades, is how are we supporting students' literacy needs? Um, if if we don't build a foundation in literacy, then students are going to struggle for the rest of their academic <laughs> career. So that's really uh, important, and I really appreciate the. Um, memo that you shared with um, a lot of those questions that I had about where do we see literacy versus math intervention in the budget and you really clarified you know where do those positions sit and how many of them um, are there so I, I do really appreciate that as well and then the third piece is um, really strong tier one instruction so the general <coughs> education instruction well, in sure. the Thank you. Um, general education classroom and so a couple of places that I see that is the um, Orton Gillingham mm -hmm. training which is for so many um, students you know, general ed students that are going to uh, benefit from that from the the teachers as well as the technology and you talked about keeping up with new modes of learning and new modes of instruction and, and keeping kind of our district on the cutting edge and so you know when you implement any new curriculum if you don't have PD to go with it, it it falls flat, right? And so with the one-to-one -one program, if you don't have this tech administrator to help teachers actually use it well, then we're just, you know, kind of spending money for no reason. Mm -hmm. So um, I do see that as really important. And having said that, particularly on um, this, the those last two pieces around literacy in tier one, I, I'd really like to see, and I'm sure this is something that you're doing um, yourself, but just wanted to see, like, what are the goals and outcomes that you as you know, your district and your team have for those programs. Like you have a really big investment, right? A big mm -hmm. bet in, in both literacy and technology. Like what are the outcomes that you wanna see from students? And I certainly don't just mean um, accountability outcomes right. like MCAS, right. but in general, like what are you hoping to get from that? How are you kind of, um, you know, holding the district and yourselves accountable for what are we, what are you putting into this and what are we hoping to see as a result? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as part of, especially with, it's almost like we're working with our teachers uh, in addressing the needs of the students that are sitting in front of them at this time, right? So we know that our students are the digital natives. They, uh, you know, good, bad, and indifferent. They're from the day they're born and getting to kindergarten, they're going to be very tech savvy. Um, so I think when we're looking at uh, technology, and we want to enhance our technology with the teachers first, but also with the students. And it's really that understanding of having the students show us, you know, what they've learned uh, in a variety of different ways, um, not just, you know, pencil and paper, you know, like the old days. So this platform allows us those big ideas in our strategic plan where we want our students to be innovative, creative, collaborative thinkers, um, this tool will allow them to do that and then uh, continue that learning outside of school. So learning is part of, we say, you know, we want this to tie to the real world. Well, the classes uh, that the teachers are teaching with the use of technology is going to expand their world outside of, of the classroom. So it's really taking that vision that we have um, for a, a portrait of a graduate and then really implementing that into the classroom. So we said we want our students to be leaders, collaborative, empathetic, all of those really important soft skills, but how does that translate in the classroom? Are we giving our students the ability to have 
uh, leadership skills, you know, in the class. And then what does that look like? So I think for us, it's really important. And then we're all, the students in front of us are all different learners. They have different uh, ways. So the tier one intervention to work with our mainstream teachers um, is critical because they can modify the curriculum to address the, the needs of all of our students. So we, that's kind of what we've been doing, I think, with our professional development uh, is working you know, as teams. We have the, our skills-based instruction that's really important to us that really ties wonderfully to the use of technology, of recreating lessons uh, where students uh, have the ability to show you what they've learned in a variety of ways. Um, so that's, I think, how it all ties together. Um, you know, and just a quick off the cuff. That's kind of, I think, the vision, and it ties directly to our strategic plan on what we want our students to have the ability, because we know the content and things are going to change. But having the ability when they leave this world, we're preparing them for jobs that aren't even existing. So they're going to need to have the skills to be flexible, collaborative, empathetic, ability to work with people, critical thinkers, problem solvers. And that's going to be mimicked in the classrooms. So we really feel with the advancement of the technology, along with tier one approaches, um, that it's just a nice blend and with some of the professional development that we have going on. Yeah, so. I, mean, I think that's great, and those are all the right goals. And I just wonder what your um, data is to, yeah, and with that, and you know, survey data, mm -hmm. vocal data is always there. I don't know how many questions are particularly tied to things like that, but right. you know, even thinking about having student surveys that talk about, are you able to, you know, showcase your learning in exactly. the, you know, some a way that's best tied to your strength, or do you feel like you have leadership in the classroom? You know, just right. some kind of survey, just so you can track for yourselves, like how much is this technology making a difference for our students? Right, and, and I agree 100%, and before COVID, we, um, we set up at the high school and also the middle school uh, student shadow days, so where a faculty member would be with the student throughout the day, follow them, um, and really sit in the classes to get a perspective of, of the student, which was really eye-opening. And then utilizing um, uh, constructive dialogue with essential partners, those students got to sit with teachers and they had a breakout session where they got to communicate and obviously in a safe place of how can learning be changed to make them you know, uh, more fun for kids. Um, and it was eye-opening. So coming back out of COVID, we're starting to pick those initiatives back. So student voice is essential uh, as we move forward. So we did have different platforms, but I agree. Student surveys, student shadow days, things like that I think are really important. Having the students at the table, so. I like that conversation. <laughs> That's why we're all here. On that note, are we are we ready for a motion? Can I, can I just make one more comment? I guess? Sure. <clears throat> so I, I remember say, I said this to everyone at the beginning, but I I don't plan on taking a vote. I'm going to vote present on on the budget, um, and I will say if this passes, I will say we are going to meet Thursday, and then um, we'll take what 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 was voted on here, and I'll work with Phil and Sean, and we'll have to have a special meeting on Thursday. I'm sorry, can you clarify that? I don't understand that comment. The special meeting. So we set up a special meeting already Thursday in case the budget didn't fit into my budget. And well, I, I actually think the meeting, uh, that's, that's good to be aware yeah. of that. I, yeah. I thought the second meeting was in case it didn't pass tonight. But that's, that's helpful to know that we're going to have an, another yeah, meeting gives, to gives work through. Yeah, that's to, good. To I'm glad to hear that because I would prefer to hear from you yeah, how it's going to change versus... Yeah, and I, I will just say, we are really close, and I really appreciate all the hard work Sean's, Sean's done on this. Um, and like I said, I, I think we'll have some good conversations uh, tomorrow, and we'll be ready to go on Thursday. Is there, is there, I'm sorry, is there even a reason to vote then if we're going to have to do this again in I think two we days? I think we should take a vote. I think so. I mean, I, the way I'm doing this, I didn't like I before didn't how, how yeah. the mayor gave the superintendent a number and then that's the budget we saw. I didn't like that. I think this is important to have these conversations. I need to hear why Sean thinks all these, these positions are valuable. And I think you should vote on it as a school committee. And, but that's, and, and then that's up to me whether that piece of the budget fits into the, the, the whole budget for the city. So. It might just be ceremonial because I'm, I'm making you guys come to another meeting, but I think it's important uh, that you guys take a vote on it. 
I move that we accept the budget as presented by the superintendent. I'm sorry, I had one more question. Do you mind if I ask? Oh, it's fine if you want to make that motion. We can have a discussion we'll have after. Some. Okay, that's fine. Second. I'll second that. We have a plethora of seconds. <laughs> the, just for the motion, the policy is DBD. Stick that into the motion. Um, we're ready for discussion. Did you get the second? Great. Discussion. Just a, a question on the groundskeeper position, because um, I don't think we've talked much about that. I know you provided the link to the original description. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the benefit of having a groundskeeper in light of capital needs and you know how sort of preventative maintenance is really important? Yeah, so um, we, there was, I think, a couple things. So we would always have a groundskeeper in the budget, and we hired uh, a few years ago a very talented groundskeeper that worked at golf courses. Um, part of his feedback, because he moved on uh, to another job, but part of his feedback on the exit interview was having one, even though he was probably the most skilled and knowledgeable employee around landscaping that we've had, he says it's impossible for, you know, he gave Steve Burkholm and myself uh, exit interview and just says this job is impossible to do for one person because they're cutting the fields, they're lining the fields for the athletics. Um, so part of that, what we end up doing is we have one groundskeeper. Our maintenance people are pulled out typically, um, you know, during the spring and summer, and they're leaving the buildings to go out and help assist with, you know, cutting the grounds and uh, weed whacking and all of that type of stuff. We pay a lot of money also for overtime for that to keep the uh, grounds uh, maintained. So this has been in the budget. Um, you know, the assistant groundskeeper uh, has been in the budget for like a couple years. Um, but yet you're pulling resources when, you know, we um, it's a hard job for one person to do. And then we're using overtime and things like that. Um, and um, this is beyond just athletic fields? Is it, it like, for example, the wear and tear out in the parking lot where it's starting to erode? Into yeah, the, the groundskeeper, street? they maintain, like, all, I mean, the city also assists with cutting. Yeah. Um, but it's really maintaining, you know, the grounds and, and the different areas. Sort of, of preventative uh, maintenance. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate that. Okay, any other discussion? And just a quick yes. question. Yes. Is there a, if we're close, is there a um, target mayor of the city appropriation? There is, but I don't, I don't think we should do it here. Okay. Because uh, I want Phil to have the opportunity to look at the numbers and, and again, there'll still be decisions that, that will be made. So I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think it's more about the number, but I think it's about where we are with the number and how that fits into to what, what, what we want to bring back to everybody. Does that, okay. make, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, whatever you give me, we'll make it work. Don't say that. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> God, oh, Mike, Jacob. Wait a second. <laughs> well, but but that's part of it. So like, whatever we bring back, if you if you all aren't happy, then you'll you'll vote it down. Right. I would imagine. No, I think so, that's a good I mean, process. I appreciate yeah, that. So. Yeah. Okay. So another stab. We'll now. vote and then vote again. I would assume this is a roll call vote. I would. I was thinking roll call vote. Is that what you'd like, Mayor? As long as I can still say president. Yes. Sure. Well, I think that makes <laughs> ma makes sense. Ms. Yell, will, or, or should we go ahead, or is there anyone else? We'll go ahead. Mayor Present. Bruce Menon? Yes. Sarah Hall? Yes. Steve Cole? Yes. Brian Callahan? Yes. Julia Walker? Yes. Breon Higgins? Yes. Thank you. For the moment, it passes. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> next, we have um, a draft of our um, meeting schedule. I noticed this isn't listed as a vote. Um, which is fine. We're meeting again on May 1st, so um, if you want to... And, sorry, yes. just a point of order. So didn't we already have a first reading on this? We didn't. I just mentioned it under new business. Oh, this is the school committee meeting schedule. Sorry, I'm confused between the two. Yeah, got um, it. I, I did mention that it was coming up. 
Um, and since it's not noted as a vote, we can just talk about it. Um, it's page 63 in our packet. Um, if there are any questions or concerns, and then we can vote on it um, on Monday. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hall. So one thing that we have talked about a whole lot and I don't believe have done yet since I've been here is have the public give basically their wish list for the coming year. Um, and the way that the calendar falls, you know, we have the joint, the city council joint meeting in November, which really always seems way too early to me because we don't really know anything what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we get to now, it's the public hearing on April 1st, but so much work has been done, the public has never really, I mean, other than sending the district emails or whatever, they never come to us in a formal manner to say, we would like to see X. So I have a suggestion that the November 6th meeting also becomes the due date for what the public would like to see the following year in the school budget. So we'll, we'll do a whole thing about it, put on a schedule, make a form, whatever it is, and say, tell us what you want, you have until this date, and then we present it um, at that meeting. Okay. And then we so, know that we've got that information if people actually want to talk about it, and then that's what, they, <laughs> that's what they get. And then it makes more sense for the following meeting with the city council so we can say, here's what the public wants from the school district, just so you know, to the council. And then we just carry on the way we, we do for the rest of the year. So you're not suggesting adding a date, but I'm saying sort just of make clarifying that the purpose of that and, meeting. And it kind of goes in there yeah. as the addendum, just like the public, uh, the public notation in red. He's it talking about some, November 6th. November 6th. That's the deadline for getting feedback to So us. we would just kind of highlight that as an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just so um, the public understands what, when the date is. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something yeah. about that? I just, I think it's a great idea. I know other districts that do this, um, you know, have public hearings earlier in the process, you know, when Sean's getting together with his leadership team, you know, some of the things that may be brought up uh, in, a, in a meeting like that might, might factor in, you know, to some, of, the, to some of those conversations. Hearing. It's just, we'll, no, but we'll I think some it districts like call it that. Tell us, so, yeah. This is how you've, you've gotten until now. And then we talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's all. Nice yeah. I like um, I, I support this idea. I, I just like to think it through a little yeah. before we put it on our calendar. I think it's a great idea to have to have it. I don't know that we need to put it on our calendar. Well, we don't. I don't. You're right. I don't think we have. I, to I have think it there, I would like. I'd love to, to consider this. It. Yes. No. I'd love to consider <laughs> right. this, and maybe November six isn't the best. You know what I mean? Like, I think the details. Maybe could we could we reserve the details sure. for? Yeah. Because I just want to I, make sure we don't forget again. Yeah. No. Yeah. I think it's a great point. I I totally support it. I just want to make sure we do it at the right time and in the right venue and maybe there's a different way we you know I just don't want to commit to that on this calendar without thinking it through a little more that's all I'm asking give ourselves some flexibility yes. yeah right I mean I would love to have people show up exactly. and and comment yeah. yes I would so yeah. thank you um, yeah yeah I just also wanted to point out that an, another mechanism for getting some feedback to us is the school councils that mm -hmm. when the school councils are discussing the budget with the uh, principals there they can also be gathering feedback from each school sure i mean you bring up a good point though and i've said this before like they never come here mm -hmm. and say hey we talked about this we rely on the principal of the building maybe um so we can think about this more before we vote on this calendar because we this isn't a rush to vote on right we don't no. have to even do it at the next meeting if we didn't want to no we don't we also, i mean the end i think of the year basically yeah i guess i right. my point is too like I think we could adopt the calendar and then try to figure out when that fits on the calendar. Sure. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to Yeah, be, and it, yeah. Can, it can integrate yeah. somebody from the school council else. coming right. to the exactly. school committee, too. Yeah. Yeah. Not as a formal thing, because we, don't, we have nothing, we can't tell them what to do, but, you know, mm -hmm. that's a general meeting of the minds. Right, mm -hmm. they're also just Great getting suggestion. going at that point. School right. councils have maybe met once or twice. At, at that point in the year, I don't think. Well, they but they've got the previous year's experience and what they've been talking about. That's true. Yeah. It's someone who's been there for yeah. longer. Okay. Yeah. Did yeah, you I, yeah, I do. I um, I think a, a couple of things. I think input's always important. I think we should look at a process, but the um, I think the ask should also also be tied to our strategic initiatives. I think that's really important yeah. um, and not because that's what's really guiding us um, with a lot of our uh, budgeting. So if there are people that have input and they're looking at those strategic initiatives, you know, I'm all for, for um, support like that too. So 
I just think it's like, how do you get that? that um, a lot of people might not want to come to a meeting per se, but as Brianna uh, Higgins said before, maybe it's developing a comprehensive survey tied to the strategic plan on what priorities they see. So, mm -hmm. but wonder if it could even be something, something else other than a business meeting, like a mm -hmm. like a workshop session. Yeah, thinking about yeah. the the meetings that the district held for strategic planning, where Correct. we got to do all of our sticky notes. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> maybe uh, maybe something like that. Yeah, would would um, we'd have more participation. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I can work with our leadership team to brainstorm uh, some protocols that might work that we can share as we move forward. I think that would probably be more successful than trying to make it one of our meetings. Mm -hmm. um, one question, because I know it's going to come up later. <laughs> Did we address the issue with the conflict on the city council <coughs> in June that we have had now for the past two years? with the budget vote <clears throat> conflicting on June, in June, the June 17th meeting and then having the um, Juneteenth holiday? Well, it, that's going to be an issue this year, and I yeah, was actually going to bring that up be. under new business. Yeah. But I believe with this calendar, it'll be fine just because that Monday is, um, you know, it's it, it doesn't conflict with Juneteenth. Okay because so they tend to do it on a Tuesday. My guess is, I mean, that's a little far off to say, but I'm guessing since June 17th is a Monday, then theirs would be on the 18th, which is the Tuesday. Okay. Um, that's just a fingers crossed, but, um, and yes, I will address this year's yeah. um, under new business. Okay. So um, anything <laughs> else for the, for the calendar? Okay, so we'll, hopefully vote on that at our next meeting on May 1st. And um, we're going to go on to subcommittee updates. Mr. Callahan, we've got uh, finance to start. Yes, uh, we met, uh, was it last week? Two weeks well, ago, thanks. last week was Mr. the vacation, so right, right. before that. Two weeks yeah. ago. Uh, the meeting was primarily about fundraising, uh, athletics-specific fundraising um, brought upon by the current baseball fundraiser, which has any number of issues. Um, so we all agreed to stop talking because the meeting was going long and essentially. <laughs> Do we have that option? <laughs> Just asking for friends. Um, I think of some other meetings I wish we had. <laughs> <laughs> Thursdays. Um, so I said to the superintendent, you know, you know, I'll give you a break until the budget cycle is over. But oh, that was nice once breaks. that happens, I would like to have the FinCom people hopefully direct the superintendent for a, like a full audit of exactly what the heck is going on with fundraising in the athletic department, where the money is, how much has come in, how it's being spent. Um, during my discovery for that meeting, I noticed that there was a policy we voted on in 2020 that said there will be a website page with the, you know, we get the current lists, but that's just static information. There's supposed to be a thing on the website with updated information as the fundraisers go along, and that was voted on in February of 2020, and then school closed the following month. Mm -hmm. So I think we all just kind of forgot that right. we had done that. Um, so yeah, you know, I just, we just have to you know fix it, fix the process. And uh, when I first met uh, Mr. Gallagher, I told him he had a year to figure out how to get later start to work, <laughs> half jokingly. And he did it in about a year, so I'll give you a year to fix this. <laughs> well, you know, I would hate to have tried to add that information to the website as it was in 2020. Oh, sure. We, yeah, we yeah. now have a m much more coherent website. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. It'll, be, it'll be great. It'll be, it'll be mm -hmm. simple for it to be posted. So we'll yeah. just have to forget can it. I, figure that out. Can I just, I know this is your report. I, I would just no, say, finished, I no. would, I would just say, I think the fundraising discussion should also connect to what our objectives are. Sure. I mean, the audit sounds great and understanding how, how much fundraising, but our objectives are, you know, to, do we need to be clear about what fundraising can be used for who can do fundraising, what forms fundraising can take. Um, there's a lot of direct solicitations of parents and it's not always right. from the coaches. Well, so I think so it, I think it would go in FinCom for that yeah, oddity part, right. and then go so, to policy. Yeah. So I think maybe a broader maybe we can coordinate on that, but sure. a broader discussion because I think that, I yeah, understanding what the what the fundraising fees are, but also 
how how do we want fundraising to be happening? I know you guys have had conversations about this in the past, but there there definitely are a lot of things that aren't directly fundraising that are still asks of parents and it's an expectation and it's an expectation of kids that aren't cl always consistent from one program to the next. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be good for us to have sort of an overall vision for. After the city council vote. Look out. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think coming, <laughs> I think we made some progress. Um, as Mr. Callan said before COVID, um, we had the, some pieces in place, but I think now that we're back uh, to, to normal in the sense of uh, schooling, I think it's important to bring that back to the table and uh, really take a hard look at it. Yep, I agree. That is um, all. And are you, are you doing the, Establish. we're gonna be voting to establish this uh, memorial fund? Oh yes, I'm sorry, right. Doing I that piece as well? That okay. from, where's that here? I lost my page. Okay. Um, the district is seeking to approve a uh, to create an account for the NHS uh, athletic department to be used for donations in memory of James T. Stalen, longtime athletic director and football coach. I make that motion. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? What do we get to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, is there any? You're taking your job. <laughs> OK. We're just creating the fund, and then the details are, will all right. be it's sorted it's similar, and arranged. It's, it, it's a similar fund um, for uh, former teacher and uh, Ms. Kim Dow. Uh, the funds Same went structure. to the okay. Presidian Library. So this would be uh, a memorial uh, fund sent in. Um, in name of uh, a great coach. Great. All in favor? Um, actually, Aye. Aye. Oh, I was going to say, I actually do have discussion because I thought of a question in the middle of I'm sorry. what the superintendent was saying. Is this a legal task for a discussion? Since even though people gave their vote. You were in the middle of asking. Really you want to, do you okay. want to well, comment Well, I guess my question it. is, yeah. we create these accounts all the time for different things. When this one gets created, is there anything specifying what the money can be spent on. I know he was an NAD and football coach, but does that mean all those donations can only go to football or all sorts of sports boosters, or how does it work? I think it's the purpose for the whole athletic department. Yeah, that's, that's why my understanding. Yeah, okay. all, all sports. All sports. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Walker, were there any um, policy subcommittee updates? Uh, only that we are working to get the sections A through C, the revised sections, in front of the school committee for first reading for next Monday. Yes, thank you. Great. <laughs> um, superintendent's report. All right. Uh, just a few items. Um, as we said, you know, one of the our goals is to create that superintendent advisory council. Uh, we've met twice. Um, so our last meeting, I shared the April third. Uh, school committee budget. Um, we had great conversations uh, from that and received some good feedback um, that helped us uh, develop some of those FAQs um, from from that group. So I'm excited about that group. It's just another group of stakeholders um, that you know we're informing over the great work that we're doing in the schools. Uh, Bresnahan Bresnahan assistant principal update. So we're pleased to announce uh, Miss Allie Burns as our new assistant principal of the Bresnahan. Uh, we had over 60 applicants for the position. And after a thorough interview process, Ms. Burns was unanimously selected. Um, she's currently the math coach at the Bres. You might remember Ms. Burns. We recognized her um, January 17th at school committee for all of her hard work. So we're excited to welcome her as part of our new administrative uh, team part of the team and I think at the next meeting we'll uh, bring her over and she can say hi to everybody um, our technology just speaking of the work we're doing uh, for the professional development our technology cohort training so our middle school tech integrated Jackie uh, Russo is currently facilitating an iPad professional learning community similar to that first uh, community that we did uh, we have over 20 teachers across the district learning the iPad technology. Um, we're really excited about that. They're uh, expected 
to finish this summer, and then we're looking to roll out another cohort of teachers um, in the fall. So I think all uh, th this initiative is growing from the bottom up, where teachers are seeing the benefit of their colleagues utilizing this technology in the class, and we get more and more uh, teachers that want to get involved so which is great it's a little bit different than the high school in the sense that high school we're focused on all of the training this is a cohort of district teachers um, from Bresnahan all the way up to the middle school so uh, we're excited about that the other piece that's really exciting and um, you know in all of us it's uh, free PD from Xterra is the Boston based technology uh, training organization, so it's XRTERRA, T-E-R-R-A. So they offer um, free professional development, but it's really in the uh, AI world, virtual reality and mixed reality, and you can kind of just get a, um, we've been talking <coughs> about this, I think, uh, through my superintendent memos to the school committee, but also um, how this technology is, is coming fast and furious, and I think we're positioning ourselves to embrace it and utilize it in a positive way. So we have a cohort of teachers, uh, high school teachers, uh, that are going through that training. Um, in addition, they provide student programming uh, for students uh, to partner with. So part of this company is also understanding that within the next year or two, there's gonna be a whole job market of mixed reality, virtual reality, and artificial uh, intelligence that the, there's not enough work for us. So part of uh, working with them is to inform parents and students of these potential jobs that are gonna be in the near future. So um, we're just excited about this opportunity, but um, you know, once again, we do have that training going on. Um, so my goal is I think by uh, the end of the year, is to kind of bring them in and kind of show uh, what what's happening uh, with that. So that would be great. And then um, through the feedback from uh, school community members and Ms. Higgins, we're penciling in, I think, the May 15th for a um, data dive into those results from a lot of the programming. That would be more of our mid-year. The goal for us, I think, is our end of the year assessments are coming at the end of May and early June. Um, but I think as we open up the school year, we can show the end of the year assessments and the growth of the students. So we'll do another data um, meeting for our school committee. So uh, we'll put that together. We'll focus on the BREZ, the um, really probably K to uh, grade eight. So we'll do similar data presentation and how the um, iReady uh, and our Dibbles tests and all of those are playing out in the classroom. So, and that's what I have. So Great. thank you all very much. Thank you. Quick question. Yes. Um, I know the enrollment, I think, period for the Apple iPad um, at the high school. Do you have any sense of the enrollment? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I can, I think for Monday's meeting, I can get you okay. specific numbers, okay. uh, but I know we're over, I know we're well over 200 students at this point, and that was a couple of weeks ago, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, new business, I have a couple items. Just confirming, um, we will be having the special meeting this Thursday, April 27th, and that is 6.30 at the Senior Center. Ms. Yell, did I get those? Did I get those details right. correct? Well, on the live, right. Right. let these three write it down. <laughs> Six thirty really? at the senior awful. center. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I I did discover that we have the a conflict with June twentieth is the same night of the um, the city council special meeting to vote on the budget. Um, so. Um, I think my recommendation at, at this point is that we can cancel that meeting. Um, we can, we don't need to do that straight away, but we'll just see how things go. Mm -hmm. um, we do have three more regular business meetings scheduled, and if we can get our work done, then we won't have to try to come up with another date um, mm -hmm. for June. Is there any other new business? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I am very, very happy to announce on behalf of the Human Rights Commission that after several years of not being able to do the uh, Peace Awards for our students in the city live, we are going live. And uh, we have the award ceremony on May 25th 
from 6 to 7.30 at the auditorium in City Hall. Uh, I believe the mayor is going to be there, whether he knows that or not. Yes. Um, <laughs> Very excited about it. Um, the uh, applications have been, dis the nomination forms have been distributed to all the schools, uh, including IC and um, a charter school. And we're really excited about, about being able to do this. So, and I just want to thank the superintendent's office have been really extraordinarily helpful, Sean and Lisa, in getting these nomination forms out. And I hope hounding. <laughs> Uh, nominators to get them to us by May 15th and then uh, we will have that award ceremony. What time is that? At? 6 to 7.30 at the auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other new business? We'll be seeing each other a lot lately so it's over. <laughs> we're good. All right, a motion to adjourn. So so second. second. <laughs> I'm sorry, I stepped on your second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 See you Thursday. Get fired up for Thursday.